Welcome to Super Shea Gaming Podcast. I am the Super Shea alongside my tag team partners. Cool Dan 1211. And. And. Go hit him on the head. Yes, sir. Ow! Oh! I'm here. And I'm here. He's uh, CMS Gaming. Sorry, so, I kind of <laughs> fell asleep while we were waiting for my brother's <laughs> phone to charge. So, uh, we are back. Last week, we talked about the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES. Uh, this week, we are moving on up to the Super NES, the SNES, whatever you want to call it, Super NES. Uh, Super Nintendo. So, let's take a rewind back to 1988. Two platforms had just been released. In America, and it was the Turbo Graphic 16 and Sega Genesis. They were both 16 bits architectures, and the NES had not even really worked on anything to upgrade. And they weren't in a real rush, but uh, it took a few years, and in 1991, they finally released the Super NES in America. Originally, it was called the uh, Super Famicom in Japan. And uh, one year later, it was released in America as the Super NES. Fun fact, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System is the first ever, ever, or I guess, is con- console to include a controller that has more than just as up, down, left, right, A, B, A, Hey, start, select. Hey. Yeah, they added the X and the Y button. But they also added shoulder buttons. That Correct. Was true. So at any rate, uh, it was released in America with five capable games. Uh, it was Super Mario World, which was actually a bundle with that game. Which, of course, this also ended up being the very same game that... I decided to make a mark on history as the greatest game ever released. It was also released alongside of F-Zero Pilot Wings, uh, both of which were, you know, fighter jet type games. And they uh, they demonstrated the console's Mode 7 pseudo 3D rendering. And it was also released alongside of Sim City and Gradius 3. Sim City? Yes, it was the uh, origins of the Sims. Oh, like Sims 4? Yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, fun fact, F-Zero is actually the only game series he's from Nintendo that actually he spans across huge time frames between games. It's really weird, but its latest game is probably also another limited time release, F-Zero 99. Really? Yeah. Now, Super Mario World was probably one of my favorites. Uh, the latter game that came out that became my ultimate favorite of that console was actually uh, Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. And fun fact, but this is actually technically the, the first game, game ever to actually make use of pitfalls in The Legend of Zelda. And Zelda 2 did include them, but they were more per you fall down, you die instantly. These were actual damaging pitfalls that also had a chance to lead to secret areas below. Oh. So it's technically also the first to include underground sections as well. This was also one of the first times that we ever saw a serious uh, game console war. Oh, yeah. yeah, we still got those. Now, here's the funny part, but Nintendo and Sega are actually the first ever or companies to have a war against each other, with, which also include ads to this, the other. Correct, and that was mostly Sega that did that. Nintendo, so, Sega does what Nintendo. Yeah, so Sega was big on, uh, you know, kind of bad talking Nintendo on their uh, commercials and such. Uh, many times they did it uh, and you know ultimately now we know what happened but at the time these two consoles were fantastic for their time frame they were state-of-the-art 
they had many, many things that they did right. Uh, and, and they just had two different models. The Genesis was propped up as the cool video game machine because they catered to an older audience. And Nintendo was just, they were already number one. And they were the big dog on campus. Funny fact here, but, but Sega's games, games actually have a bit of a legacy. He, even even though time has passed as to where they would be, be out of relevance, they're actually still relevant nowadays because you could just play the games and they would still hold up as if, if we were back in 1991. That is correct, and they still use that uh, cartridge system it, via it was all, all, albeit it was a uh, upgraded version of it. They had new chips, they had new abilities on those chips. Uh, so I mean, it was a it was a much better experience, you know, for the time. And uh, Nintendo scored a really really big game at the time, and that gave them a really huge boost up and above Sega's Genesis, which had already been out for two years. And that game that they scored was Street Fighter 2. Now, now, I don't know much about the Street Fighter series, but I do know oh, that the games technically take place is, is after the other or among different time frames. Because Street Fighter 6 actually does show much older characters. Well, in the Street Fighter game series was huge in arcades. For those of you that are too young to know what an arcade is, it's a big building that has a bunch of video games on these really, really big consoles, about human size, maybe a little bit bigger. And you used to go in, you put a quarter in the machine, and you got to play the game until you died. Or tokens, depends on which. Or tokens. Depends on what the arcade does. Normally, they use tokens to make more money. At any rate, uh, Super Nintendo scored the rights to put that game out for Capcom, and uh, it became a huge success, and kind of gave them the edge over Sega in the early runs of the Super NES. Now, I think Capcom is also the same company that made Mega Man. Correct. And Sega, at the time, had a much, much larger... Uh, game pool because they had already been out for two years they had a bunch of games that had already been released and you know it was just and they were a little less costly than the Nintendo at the time Uh, but all in all the Super Nintendo was out there and it proved to be the superior uh, game console at the time And then uh, after that, neither neither the Sega or the Nintendo could create a definitive lead over each other. They were kind of back and forth here and there. But of course, course nowadays we know that Sega ended up becoming a partner company to Nintendo. Well, yeah, that's far in the future after, you know, Sega went out and just became a game maker instead of a console maker. But the game that is that is said to have established the Super NES's dominance is Donkey Kong Country. Now, the Donkey Kong series actually takes place is alongside the Mario series as its own thing, but it hasn't seen another game, game release since Donkey Kong Kong, Kong Country the the um, Frozen game. I, I I forgot the name, but it had Funky Kong on release alongside it on the Nintendo Switch. Now, the funny thing about the 16-bit uh, Super Nintendo is it came out later than the other 16 bits and beat them. And it was still in production and they were still making games and doing all kinds of stuff with it when the first PlayStation came out. Now, now, this is when the console wars really started. Fun fact. PlayStation was going to partner with Nintendo, but then they decided not to. Yeah, that's that's a story for a, a different time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll be covering companies later on after we're done co- 
covering Nintendo. Correct. But there was also another revolutionary game console that came out at the same time as PlayStation, and that was the Sega Saturn. Now, last, last time I checked, that ended up being a bit of a flop. Yeah, it was a total flop. Uh, so much so that the Dreamcast was never taken seriously, which it... it had some really good concepts, but again, we'll get into that when we get into Sega. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We don't want to go too far in or else we won't get another series. Well, and this. prior to even the uh, the Sega Saturn, Sega came out with a attachable system called the Sega CD. Now, fun fact, but this isn't in Sega's first time doing attachables. Their first attachable whole concept ever was actually a game. Sonic and Knuckles, which could attach to Sonic Free to create a completed package. We'll get into that later. So at any rate, uh, the Super Nintendo did a lot of things right. Nintendo at the time was the biggest name in console gaming. There are. Uh, They are recently becoming such again. I think PlayStation still has them numbers-wise. Yeah, because of the PS5, but we'll get into that when we cover cover PlayStation. Well, Sony, to be specific. But as far as the Super Nintendo goes, they had a new designed uh, remote, which was fantastic. Had the rounded-off side. Oh, we're, we're still talking about Super Nintendo? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's what today's about. You want to know what the Gat controller was called? The dog bone. <laughs> yeah, the dog bone controller. They were awesome. Oh yes, uh, and, and it was it was a great console. Now, how to get into specifics on what what the dog bone controller is? It's basically a controller with two circles and a line connecting the two. Now, on the left circle is the D pad. Uh, yes, we'll be going into D-pads a lot, but the D-pad was a custom homemade type of thing. Yes. So, right now, cool Dan talking, um, we could just easily say this. It's like a PlayStation 5 controller if you've seen one, but without the thumb sticks and the, the side head grips, it's just rounded off edges near the D-pad and the buttons. Now, the buttons were in the a line section of the, the dog bone. Yes. And, and the buttons were on the right side. Hey, you got A and B in a purple hole, I guess, long circle, circular, 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 circular line. And, and on top of that, on the rest of the open part of the controller, is the X and Y button, but they aren't positioned exactly as they are nowadays. It's actually A, B, 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 Y, X, going from um, right to left. That's right, down, up, left. Also, um, it is the same size as a NES controller. Technically, a little. It was smaller. a little bit. It was actually a little bit bigger because of the rounded off side. Yeah. Yeah, but, but if we were to on the whip to side, make those rounded sides square, or it's actually a little bit smaller. On the whip side, it is the same as an NES. As I remember. The whip thickness, pretty much. Yeah. The the thickness is about the same size. Yeah. So officially. The Super NES released 1,757 games. That's a lot of games. Yes. yes now, it is. here in North America, we got to see 717 of those games. Oh. Plus, four championship cartridges. Now, were... oh, how about we go into championship car- on tr- cartridges for a moment? Because they might want to know about these limited edition and cartridges. The champion... The... The competition was based on the NES cartridge titled Nintendo World Championships 1990. It's unknown how many gray cartridges were made and the highest numbered as of September 2020 
is number 353. Copies of the gray cartridge were given to 90 finalists after the championships concluded. Another 26 gold copies are known to exist, similar to the gold cartridge design of The Legend of Zelda. The original. Which were given as prizes in a separate contest by Nintendo Power Magazine. Both versions have an exposed bank of DIP switches to set the amount of time the player has to complete the three games shorter and longer than the 6 minutes 21 seconds used in the actual competition. So those championship cartridges were special editions and there were only a select number of them. Now, what exactly are they? We just want to forget them. Yeah, they're they're championship cartridges. (laughs) Like... What's on them, and and just what are they in general for gamers? Uh, the uh, Nintendo announced in 2015 the return of Nintendo World Championships for the 25th anniversary of the original event as part of the company's E3 2015 coverage. Qualifying competitions began on May 30th, in eight Best Buy locations across the United States. At each location, contestants competed for the high score in a custom mode of an Ultimate NES Remix. Oh, I actually he played some of those game, games and, and they're specifically he remixes of the original level for specific games for, with special conditions. That is correct. Like, you have to beat the game without losing a single coin. They're talking about Sonic with frames. No. The winners from each of these eight locations, plus eight players invited by Nintendo, six speedrunners, and two celebrity contestants became the contestants for the live event. Jordan DeMarco easily took the title. No original competitors from the 1990 event thus qualified for this event. So the competition used an elimination tournament format. And basically, it was held, uh, it was streamed online from Los Angeles on June 14th. Commentators included Audrey Drake of Nintendo Treehouse and competitive Pokemon VGC commentator Justin Flynn. An edited exclusive one hour television special aired on Disney XD later on in the year, featuring retrospective interviews with many contestants and a shortened overview of the competition. Shame that not a lot of people saw it due to the flop that was Disney XD. The last contest consisted of custom levels within the then unreleased Super Mario Maker on Wii U. Played by the two finalist professional Smash Brothers player, John Numbers, a qualifying player from New York City, and a professional speedrunner, Narcissa Wright. In the first two levels, the players were alternately blindfolded while the other played it. The player who completed the levels the fastest would receive a five-second advantage in the final level. In the final level, they raced simultaneously to the end, where Numbers won the championship title. Now, funny enough, I think they actually released these, these special levels later on on in Super Mario Maker's his lifetime on the Wii U. Which, so yeah, and this was a big thing for Nintendo. They started that whole uh, championship thing with, uh, with the Super Mario 3 game. Nowadays, because Nintendo isn't well known for her liking championships nowadays, but this specifically applies to... He's the Smash. They still do some championships nowadays. Smash, uh, if you were to try to do something on it, like mod it, it'd immediately take down your video, pretty much. Now, Super NES had a multitude of games, but many of those games, and this is this is what Nintendo has done so incredibly well since its inception, is they have created great games, many of which are touted as the greatest games in the history of gaming. Uh, the Super NES has many of those, such as Super Mario World, which came out in 1990. The Legend of Zelda, Link 
A Link to the Past, 1991. Final Fantasy VI, 1994. Donkey Kong Country, 1994. Fun fact about Donkey Kong Country. Hey, these sprites that you see in there are not sprites. They're models. Correct, that was a 3D model. Earthbound, 1994. Never heard of that one. Super Metroid, hey, 1994. Chrono Trigger, 1995. <laughs> and Yoshi's Island, Fun fact. 1995. Fun fact about Yoshi's Island, but this is technically a prequel to the entire Mario series as a whole, but, but it actually has its own lore. So the Yoshi that we see in there is not the same Yoshi that appears in Super Mario World. Also, there's a Game Shark 4. That's not, that's not a Game Shark. What that is, what? is a Super Game Boy. What it was, was a cartridge that you put into your Super NES, oh. and you could put a Game Boy cartridge inside of that cartridge and play Game Boy games on the Super Nintendo. Oh, fun I, fact. I've heard of this one. So, fun fact. The Super Game Boy is actually the first ever portable device that ports over Game Boy games to, to the Super Nintendo. This is actually a a lifelong thing that Nintendo's been known for with backwards compatibility. But this isn't backwards compatibility. This is forward compatibility. Okay, can I continue? Go ahead. So there's actually the same thing on, on the GameCube called the GameCube Cube Game SP or something of that. It's where you put it on the bottom with the connector scare. You were to connect it to the GameCube via the bottom, and then you would put your Game Boy Advance games in together. Now, I didn't know that this actually existed, but that's actually kind of cool, and it's technically another example of forward compatibility. But I think this was the first example of backwards compatibility since the Game Boy Advance came out before the GameCube, I think. Correct. And there were a lot of peripherals that came with, that came alongside the uh, Super Nintendo, uh, such as the multi-tap. The multi-tap was a peripheral that allowed up to five players to play on the same console. Really? Yeah, you plugged it in and you could put up to five controllers. Now, fun fact, but the most that... The most amount of players that could play one game at once was actually eight. And this was specifically for Mario Party. He now, the NES also had one, but it only had four controllers available to it. Yeah. Uh, no, that was just specifically for specific games, but, but this also allows for quite a lot of shenanigans. It also had a Super Scope light gun, the Super NES mouse, for a point and click interface. This was specifically made for Mario Paint. Correct. Uh, and there was one other one I wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the game that really put the Super NES over the top of Sega in the beginning, that Street Fighter 2, there was a special joystick that was made for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And it was an arcade style controller. It had a big platform, the big buttons, and the uh, joystick. Joystick. I I've heard of this before. It looks pretty much if you were to if you remember what an arcade is. Yes, it's it's one of those really really big human sized consoles that held a screen and you put a quarter in and you'd be able to play the game until you died. Yes, if you remember when it goes, you, if you see where that joystick and buttons are, that's pretty much what that looks like. Now, mind giving us the name of it? Uh, it was... It was just the uh, Street Fighter 2 controller. There's no real... Yeah, there wasn't a special name for it or anything. Well, I plan on oh. calling it the fighter controller. Oh, no. There was also an unusual controller, uh, a couple of them. Oh, wait, here we go. Fighter Power Stick. Hmm. The Capcom Fighter Power Stick. Yep. 
Uh, there were also some really unusual ones like the batter up baseball bat, uh, the life fitness entertainment system, and exercise bike controller with built in monitoring software. The T the T E E V Golf Golf Club. What? T as in teeing up V Golf Golf Club. And the Justifier, a revolver shaped light gun made by Konami for lethal enforcers. What? There's a lot of unusual items here, but Nintendo is actually known for the, for those, which also includes and is not limited to the Power Glove. Wait, head up. Hmm. So what I absolutely loved about the Super Nintendo is it was so incredibly innovative in its time, uh, and Nintendo has been amazing at doing that they they are constantly changing the game uh i think that's my favorite thing about nintendo period is that when they do a new console it's different they do something completely different something completely exciting i mean even with the uh even with the consoles that didn't do so well and we'll talk about those in in future podcasts but like With the Wii, they did the motion controller. With the GameCube, the N64. N64's uh, controller was very wonky, though. I mean, everything they did was so very different from what everybody else was doing. And I think that's what I love the most about them. Fun fact, the reason why the Nintendo 64 first controller was designed like it was meant to be played with free hands is because I think they were also... in who intending it to who also accommodate for games that don't use the joystick. Really, we've gone through a lot on the Super Nintendo. We have gone through a lot of information, but let's talk about some of the games. So Super Mario World. Very first game to introduce Yoshi. Now, now Yoshi acted like any other power-up. Uh, Pete, if you got hit you would lose him. However, Yoshi is also the first to introduce a power-up that you can get back as soon as you get hit. When you get hit, you fall off of Yoshi and he starts running off. Uh, But if you can catch up to him and jump on him, you could get him back. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was fantastic. He could also power up by eating the little fruits on on the bushes or trees. Correction. He powers up by eating Koopas. Now, Koopas? Now, uh, there's four different Koopas that Yoshi can eat, but not swallow. Green Koopa does nothing. Red Koopa, upon eating, and instead of spraying out a shell, he'll spit out free fireballs, which has become a n- main state for eating red Koopas, as in basically any fire object, and, and throughout time. And blue Koopas allows him to fly. Yellow Koopas. Well, I said four Koopas, but I'm technically lying here. Yellow Koopa. If he eats it, he stomps it. Rainbow Koopa. This is specifically he done and on specific levels. Was where there's a special shellless Koopa that jumps into a shell. It immediately turns rainbow and starts starts homing in on you. Yeah, it starts spinning and coming toward you. If Yoshi eats it, he gains all the effects of all the Koopa shells. The stomp, pump, light, and upon spinning out the shell, fire. And I, Will it stick? And I cannot tell you how many hours I sank into Super Mario World. It was such a fun game. And, and again, that's another one of the things that I love about Nintendo. Their games were just fun games. It wasn't about realism. It wasn't about blood splatter or anything else. It was just simply fun. The, uh, the puzzle stuff was amazing. The characters were innovative and ingenious, and everything that they did with those Mario games were, was just fantastic. 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 All right. Um, <laughs> moving on. Would that Yoshi stick with you between levels? Yes. Yes, he will. Also, aren't there more types of Yoshis, like a blue baby Yoshi, red baby Yoshi? No? Well, actually, correction. 
These Yoshis can be found in Super Mario World special levels. Now, there's five different special levels, but like, there's even a special set of levels after completing these five levels. These, this is called Special World and Champions Road. Road. And this is technically the first time where Nintendo has actually done a special zone. Now, the Special World had five levels that you had to complete. However, there were special requirements. They all had the same requirement. Find the secret exit. Correct. Also, these secret exits could be found between levels, right? Well, not exactly. These special... These secret exits were actually found in specific levels, and they... They technically led you to a different path, but... Most of them looped right back around to the original level, but... They technically took you to a different, harder level, and then sent you back. I also... But remember, in Super Mario World, aren't there specific levels that have these weird giant power switches? Oh, palaces. Now, these are not the same as castles or towers. Palaces were, were used to allow you to unlock special blocks. Yellow blocks, green blocks, and pink blocks. These three... He pal- switch palaces allowed you to unlock special blocks to make levels easier or unlock their secret exits. Correct. And also it introduced a few new features as far as power-ups. Uh, you got the uh, the cape where you did that spin. Oh, Tanuki Fetter? No, Tanuki was in uh, Super Mario Bros. 3, 3. but also... Well, technically, it wasn't Tanuki. It was the the raccoon tail or yeah. something like that. But the Tanuki suit actually did it, it appear in Super Mario Bros. Free. But we'll get to that one when we get to the Game Boy Advance. I couldn't. A, I could. Oh, sw- hold on, I'm still talking here. We'll get into to all of this when we get into the Game Boy Advance line. But we'll talk about it specifically when we get to the topic of Super Mario Bros. Advance. So yeah, they also introduced a feature where uh, instead of like in Mario 3 where you hit the star at the end of the level, there was a moving bar. Bar. And, uh, you know, it was completely different from any of the other games. Uh, in the first one, you had the flagpole that you had to hit the top of. This one, the goal was to hit that bar that was moving. Now, you didn't exactly have to hit it, hit, but uh, you could just pass by it and you would still clear the level. You just wouldn't get any star points. Right, and, and the goal was to get those star points. Because collect 100, you get a free life. And the uh, what they did with the, uh, with the booze in that game... They gave them their own room, their own type of stage. Now the haunted the, mansion. Yeah. Yeah. And now the the boo houses are actually the interesting. They're non-linear levels. You don't have to go to them. Actually, correction. You actually have to yeah, go through do. some of them. Then what the flip does non-linear mean? It means that the level loops. Oh. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of fake rooms and fake doors. And they'll which, take you back to other areas that you've already been to. And another door. Basically, the way to actually clear these is that you have to solve their puzzle. And the puzzles were fantastic. I mean, they Nintendo really thought these games through, and they really... They, they came through with some absolutely amazing stuff. By the way, I thought the icon for the cape was a fetter. It was. Then what the heck was the fetter's name? The Feather. Actually, it's, <laughs> it was called... I think it was actually called the... The Power... Her cape or... No, wait. I know it had a name. Name, I, I'm just forgetting it at the moment. Anyways, uh, moving on. The next game... Peanut on Butter, our... that's what it was called. Oh, yes, yes. So the next game we are moving on to is The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, which was made in 1991. 
Fun fact. Fantastic this, game. Fun fact. This is actually the first ever appearance of the, the Master Sword. And what a game it was. I mean, this is another, I know you, I know I've said it before and I'll say it again. I sank so many hours into that game. I mean, I would sit in front of my TV for hours upon hours a day. He was, it was back when Mingo's ginormous, his TVs were still a thing. CRTs, some um, we were called. We call Actually, we called them the boob tube. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, since, Super Shade here has sunk like over 800 hours into it. <laughs> no, wait, 8,000 hours. Actually, surprisingly, that might not even be far from the truth. Yeah, it <laughs> probably isn't because Zelda so, was my favorite franchise from the very beginning. So let's have him talk about this all the time for right now. Yeah, I, I want your I want your guys' feedback too. At any rate, uh, Legend of Zelda: Link to the Past. It, it was so phenomenal. They added so many new things to this game. Uh, you know, rocks that you had to lift and, or push out of the way and you needed special items to do so. Uh, you know, power glove, power ring. What's a power ring? You, you had to get this in order to uh, break and or move boulders. Oh, yeah, that. That... And I, I was thinking in of the a Nintendo a Power Glove, which which went by the same name. Also, the Power Glove was actually kind of a flop. Well, it was pretty much a flop because it just did not control well with the the games. I mean, it technically worked as the first ever wireless controller from Nintendo. It didn't even have many games for it to work. It was a great idea. That was made way ahead of its time. If if they were to redo it now, I'm sure it would be far better. It would have to make two who a left hand and a right hand, and then make a headset for it. But e- either way, I feel like they were way ahead of their time when they thought about doing that because it was a great idea. It just they they didn't have the technology to do it at the time. Yeah. Also, this reminds me of another console, but we'll talk about it later. The Virtual Boy. Oh, uh, actually, we can talk about that a little bit because it did not have a lot of content at all. It had like barely any content. It did have a really good tennis game, but it was made way ahead of its time. Actually, no. The main problem with the Virtual Boy. Hey, and this is actually seen in Luigi's Mansion 3, which we'll get into once we get to the Switch. But, really? But the entire point of it was that everything was red. And it hurt a lot of people's eyesight, so that's why it didn't make, make a lot of content. I also heard it was kind of cancer causing. Uh, no, it wasn't. That's what that, I heard. That's no. just a lie fabricated by haters who don't want to accept the truth that... Yeah, it, it wasn't it, cancer causing. It was just eye damaging. Yeah. Oh yeah. It hurt a lot of people's eyesight, but a lot of people confused it with cancer because they're a bunch of idiots. At any rate, back to Legend of Zelda. A link to the past. With this game, I've only played the DS port, which apparently sucked. <laughs> well, it's 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 hard to port a game over from one console to another and make it have the same impact that it had on the previous console because that previous console was state of the art in its time but to move it up to the next generation of consoles it's hard to get that wow factor from an older game that was made for an older system also um the ds was made after the game boy series which uh, we'll get to later, and also get to later on the DS. And yeah, it's really hard to port a game from um, S, S, the Super Nintendo, all the way up, like seven generations, to the DS. Well, the DS is technically the, the a fourth generation co- console, but it was actually the first generation hen- Well. Actually, no, it's the fourth generation handheld and console. Well, you get what I mean, right? Uh, kinda. 
So it is now being, I mean, it, it has been ported over to the Switch. Really? Yeah. But it's hard, again, it's hard to, on a 2023 console, 2022 console, to get that same wow factor. Actually, I think the Switch was made in 2019. 2019, yeah. So it's hard to get that same wow factor that it had with the SNES in 1991. Uh, the, the game was fantastic, though. Story as usual, you know, Ganon, Ganon is kidnapping Zelda, okay. and you're trying to save Zelda, and you have to go through several different dungeons, solve many, many puzzles, collect items, and eventually defeat Ganon to rescue Zelda. Fun fact, Ganon is the exact same Ganondorf from um, Ocarina of Time. The story is set many years before the events of the first two Zelda games, so this is actually kind of a precursor. The player assumes the role of Link as he journeys to save Hyrule, defeat the Demon King Ganon, and rescue the descendants of the Seven Sages. It returns to a top-down perspective similar to the original Legend of Zelda, dropping the side-scrolling gameplay of Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, which wasn't as great as the original. It was still fun, but it, it had its flaws. Too, it was just too different. Yeah. It introduced series staples such as parallel worlds and items including the Master Sword. Now, fun fact. This is actually the first game to introduce up upgrades to the Master Sword. Kinda. It's the first game to introduce the Master Sword, period. Yeah. And it is widely considered among the greatest video games ever made. Uh, with particular praise for its presentation and innovative gameplay. It was ported to the Game Boy Advance as a link to the past and the four swords. It's in 2000 and, and two, it, and sold over 6 million copies across both platforms by 2004. It, it was subsequently released on the Wii, Wii U, nin, new Nintendo 3DS via the Virtual Console, the Nintendo Switch via ne Nintendo Switch Online, and the Super... NES Classic Edition, a sequel for A Link Between Worlds, was released for the Nintendo 3DS in 2013. So, moving on to our next game, came Final Fantasy VI, 1994. Now, fun fact, but the Final Fantasy series has been going on for 16 different games, but... Most of their games have featured re-releases and also oh, different editions. Fantastic games. I am I am a huge fan of the Final Fantasy series. I've played most, if not all of them, many times. So, Final Fantasy VI, set in a world with technology, technology, technology. Represent, resembling. resembling the second industrial revolution, the game's story follows an expanding cast that includes 14 permanent playable characters, the native narrative. narrative details with the themes of rebelling against an immortal mer military mm -hmm. dictatorship, pursuit of a magical arms race, use of chemical weapons in warfare. Now, a uh, fun, funny part is he meant to say immoral. Immoral? Yeah, immoral. Really? I don't know. The game won numerous awards. It's it's another one of those game series that is iconic. Uh, you know, all the Final Fantasy games have been epic adventures. Now, a oh, fun fact, but each Final Fantasy game it technically doesn't connect to each other, but the only one that has done a direct sequel is, is Final Fantasy X, and I, with X-2. That is correct. X-2? Yes. Yeah, it's X-2. 
that's 10 2. That's like the second half of the story. Oh, wow. Um, this game is amazing. Supposedly, I've never played it. I might watch videos on it later, but we'll just see. Yeah. So, um, this, this entire series has been going, going on for 16 different games. Well, 16 asteroids, because there yeah. are other releases that are either direct sequels or just have two different versions or even a third one. Or just remakes. Or just remakes. And it alludes to a conflict known as the War of the Magi, which occurred 1,000 years prior to the beginning of the game. Really? Yes. Uh, three quarreling entities known as the Warring Triad used innocent humans as soldiers by transforming them into enslaved magical beings called espers. Triad right. realized their wrongdoings. They freed the espers and sealed their own powers inside three stone statues. Sound familiar? Yes, very much so. From an anime. But it, it was... It was another one of those uh, epic games that Final Fantasy put out and has great story. And it, for its time, had incredible graphics. I mean, they Square Enix is known for doing that. And at the time, both of those companies were separate. It wasn't Square Enix. There was Square and then there was Enix. Also, we have enough time for one more game. Donkey Kong Country, 1994. Now, I'll focus on talking about Donkey Kong Country because there's quite a lot of it that some people might not know about. So, going based off of what we are seeing right now, if we scroll down. But let's, let's see what Austin has to say. So, Donkey Kong Country. This is actually the first ever game to include 2.5D. But it's not in the way you expect. What? The backgrounds and stuff are actually 2D, but Donkey Kong, Kong, Kong Diddy Kong, and, and all their animal buddies is, are all in 3D, including in the enemies. This is the, the reverse 2.5D that we've come to know and love. Now, well, they were all models imported into the game, but this required a special chip to do it. I won't get into that because I don't know no chips and stuff. So... In Donkey Kong Country, you you play as Donkey Kong, and and in this game, you only have one hit point, and kind of like the Crash Bandicoot series. If Donkey Kong gets hit, you lose. But how exactly can you, I don't know, overcome this? You gotta break a barrel open to get Diddy Kong. Diddy Kong acts as, as a second hit point, but this works both ways. Now, Diddy Kong has the, the natural talent of being smaller than Donkey Kong, so he has less of a hitbox. I'll, I'll get into that a bit later on, but the main goal of the game is to get your bananas back. Because the evil oh, crocodile, oh, King K. Rule, who oh, stole all of, of Donkey Kong's bananas from his secret banana stash. I have no idea how he found his secret banana stash, but it's probably because Donkey Kong, Kong actually left at the huge sign that says the PK's banana stash. Don't touch. Now, Donkey Kong is not the Donkey Kong that everyone else remembers from Mario vs. Donkey Kong. Well, just or from Donkey the original Kong. Donkey Kong. Now, this is actually his grandson. And we have no idea what happened to Donkey Kong the second, but we know that. And Donkey Kong now has become Cranky Kong. And Cranky Kong is the same Donkey Kong that had Jumpman fought in Donkey Kong. Also, that was the original name of, of the character in Donkey Kong, the arcade game. Now, Jumpman is supposedly Mario, but let's just say the differences are too apparent, so it might be Mario's grandpa. And this is a side-scrolling adventure with 40 levels. Uh, you jump between platforms and avoid obstacles, collect items, ride minecarts and animals, defeat enemies and bosses, and find secret bonus stages. In multiplayer modes, two players can work cooperative, cooperatively or race each other. Now, 
how to get into more insight about how the game. And you play as Donkey Kong at first. First in the first level, Donkey Kong jumps out of his house and starts moving along his adventure. Or if you get hit by any of the Kremlins, and which are the crocodile people that, that Donkey Kong supposedly hates, hates you die because Donkey Kong is not Mario. Well, he kinda is, but you have to jump on the Kremlin's heads to defeat them, and although well, in later games, you have a health system, but I'll get into that far, far later when we get into the Wii era. You know, funny, uh, fun fact here, uh, and I just, I'm just now learning this, uh, that Donkey Kong Country was Nintendo's answer to Sega's Aladdin. They, they commissioned this company from England called Rare to create a game to rival Sega's Aladdin in 1993 and what they came up with was reviving the dormant Donkey Kong franchise now fun Uh, I'll let you go on Rare assembled 12 developers to work on Donkey Kong Country over 18 months Donkey Kong um, Country was inspired by the Super Mario series and was one of the first home consoles, well, home console games to feature pre-rendered graphics. Now, now, to get into the story a little bit, King K. Rool is a evil, evil Kremlin who, who grew gluttonous for bananas. I have no idea why, but he just is. Is and he decided it on his pirate ship to visit the Kong Island. And which is Donkey Kong's island and that he supposedly has and owns. And he sent his Kremlins to grab ban- have the banana stash from, from Donkey Kong's banana stash and, and take them over to his ship. However, along the way, they dropped a bunch of bananas and then you have to travel through, so I think, take a few worlds to get to King K. Rool's ship to fight him. Now... Quick warning about King K. Rool. He does not go down easily. In fact, he has two phases. The first phase looks like a normal boss fight where you have to avoid his attacks and jump on his head. But, once the credits start playing, pay attention to the letters. Because every C will be replaced with a K. The game is not over yet, and he'll try to surprise you, the player, her by taking out your... Out the Kongs while you aren't paying attention. And Donkey Kong Country came out in 1994 and became, at the time, the fastest selling video game with 9.3 million copies sold worldwide. It's the third best selling SNES game in history and the best selling Donkey Kong game. Following that success, Nintendo purchased a large minority stake in the Rare Company, which became a prominent second-party developer for Nintendo during the late 90s. Now, what uh, was it, the first, first best-selling game? Don't know. Super Mario Brothers. Like, in the S- SNES library. Oh, for the SNES? Uh, the best-selling of all time there was The Legend of Zelda. No surprise. Yeah, no surprise whatsoever. But Donkey Kong Country is credited with helping Nintendo win the console war of the 90s. And it maintained the SNES's popularity into the fifth generation of video game consoles. So, we are about out of time. But before we go, I do want to let you know that we all have channels on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, everywhere that there's social media. So you can find my channels. They are called Super Shape Tutorials. My channel, which is called Cool Dan Twelve Eleven, and my channel, which is ACMS Gaming. Right now, I'm currently taking a little bit of a break, but I will be back with videos next week. And we also have Shay Girl, who does com- comedic videos, and uh, they're just really funny. But currently, uh, she's been dealing with some very naughty elves. Yes, yes, she's been dealing with some elves that got left behind. 
And uh, you can find all of those on any of our channels, or you can find all of our channels if you go to uh, ToucheProductions.com. The number two. The number two, S-H-E-A, Productions, all one word, dot com. And that is all. Thank you so much for coming to watch or uh, they, they can't watch it's, uh. it's a podcast not a video hey listen <laughs> to our podcast take a shot every time you hear that on the at podcast. this podcast final thoughts super shay thank you all we love you hope you all have a phenomenal awesome week acms final thoughts Meow. and for my final thoughts moth Bozini. Excuse me? Moth. Have a moth an awesome day. Oh, uh, what?